tell you something. I don't know how to <coughs> say this, but I'm dying. I have learned, and I don't know how much longer I have. It may be weeks, maybe months, maybe years. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe 40 or 50 years by the grace of God. You see, I've been diagnosed with a terminal condition. It's called human mortality. And the statistics on this condition are pretty overwhelming. <coughs> Romans 5 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. See, I have bad news for you. You have this condition too. Today, you are one day closer to your death than you were yesterday. How's that for a thought to wake up to every morning? That's pleasant. I know, this sounds like a downer. We don't like to talk about it, but there is wisdom. There is wisdom in squarely facing our own mortality. Uh... <coughs> The preacher in Ecclesiastes says, The day of death is better than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning, M O U R, mourning, than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. It's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. It causes us to think. To think about what really matters. Psalm 90 prays this way. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's much wisdom in contemplating our own death. This is what Paul is doing here in 2 Corinthians 5. And he actually finds much encouragement, much comfort from looking at what happens. What happens to a believer, one who is trusting in Jesus when they die? Let's pray before we dive into our text today. today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you give us solid rock, solid Truth that is an anchor for our souls in the midst of the storms of life. Help us to cling today to your truth. Help us to take comfort and be encouraged to persevere from what you have to say to us today. Give us ears to hear your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. And my aim today is to step back from the passage, uh, to take in the big picture, to understand the categories in which Paul is thinking. Uh, we're going to skip, in doing that, we're going to skip some precious and some important details. But don't worry, I plan in the coming weeks to come back and spend some time looking at those things that we just won't have time for this morning. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, but we need to remember, chapter breaks are not original. They were added about the 13th century, to help us find our way around the Bible. Therefore, our convenience. But it's important not to allow them to disrupt the flow of thought. See, originally this was a letter, and it just flowed. 
Chapter 4 flowed immediately into chapter 5. It wasn't, well, I read chapter 4 today. I'm going to close it up and put it away. And maybe next week I'll come back and read chapter 5. It's a letter. It flows. Paul in chapter 4 likens himself to a fragile earthen vessel. He says his outer person is wasting away. Verse 10, he says he is always carrying around in his body the dying of Jesus. And he is always being given over to death. The suffering, the death of the apostle, and by extension of every believer, every follower of Jesus, is the subject under consideration as he comes uh, now to this section. Death is staring him in the face. And he is not in denial. The Corinthians, on the other hand, they are enamored with eloquence, enamored with power, with appearances. Suffering and death in that cultural context, as in ours, is out of style. But Paul aims, in all of this book, really, to keep the cross central. To Christianity. His focus, his preaching is that Christian hope can survive, even thrive in the face of suffering, in the face of persecution, in the face of death. <coughs> he says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, chapter 3, verse 4. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, we do not lose heart, chapter 4, verse 1. So, we do not lose heart, chapter 4, verse 16. He says in 5, 6, So, we are always of good courage. And again in 8, Yes, we are of good courage. Courage. How? How can we be unshaken in the face of suffering and death, in the face of our own mortality? Paul tells us in chapter 4, verse 18, we looked at last time, it matters what you look at. It matters what you're paying attention to, what you're fixing your eyes on. We are to look, he says, not at what we see. Go back to last week's message. We're to look not at what we see. We're to look at what we don't see, what we can't see. We're to look at the eternal weight of glory that our sufferings are preparing for us. In chapter 4, verse 14, he holds out the hope of the resurrection. He says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. Knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into His presence. Brothers and sisters, this is it. Being in the presence of Jesus. Here in chapter 5, he details for us what this unseen reality looks like, what it consists of, this hope, the hope of the resurrection. What is it that happens to the believer at death? Let's look at the text. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, not longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, 
We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What Paul does here, he answers criticism, he answers fear with truth, doctrine, theological truth. He knows something, and the truth he knows shapes how he feels, it shapes how he responds, shapes how he lives. Circumstances come, how do you respond to those circumstances? How do you feel about those circumstances? What do you do? Truth shapes those responses. Doctrine, knowing, he says, chapter 5, verse 1, verse 6, verse 11, knowing punctuates the passage. There is something we know. It's not something, he says, I, I think, I feel like this might be true. I wish or hope this might be true. He says, I know. I know. What we know gives confidence, even in the face of outer destruction and death. Theological truth gives hope. Theological truth fuels perseverance. We need to know our Bibles. We need to know the great truths that are taught in the Bible. Because that is what gives us an anchor to stand in the middle of the storms. So what is the truth that Paul knows? Now ironically, this passage has been the subject of much scholarly debate over what Paul actually meant by what he said. Uh, this is probably one of the central discussion points in scholars over, well, how do we understand this? What does he mean? I don't want to brush that off too glibly because it's a hard passage. It's a difficult passage. Some scholars are even so bold as to accuse Paul of changing his view between 1 Corinthians 15 and the writing of 2 Corinthians 5. Well, he said this back here in 1 Corinthians 15, and then a couple of years later, he experienced a little more of life, and he said, eh, yeah, it's actually like this. These interpreters seem to ignore one of the fundamental principles of biblical interpretation. How, how do you go about trying to understand what the author meant by what he said. If you interpret a passage that makes it contradict what is plainly taught elsewhere in Scripture, then your interpretation is wrong. You are wrong. Like, well, I think this means this. I know it totally flatly flies in the face of what it says over here. You're wrong. It's as simple as that. Yes, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and Paul wrote 2 Corinthians and Paul was a flawed, weak human being. But God inspired Paul to write his word, his infallible word. And God doesn't contradict himself. 
God doesn't change his views. God doesn't say, well, yeah, I know I said that back then, but yeah, I went through some stuff and it made me change my mind. I learned some stuff that I didn't know before and it's not the God we worship. Many scholars have stumbled over the present tense of the verb, we have, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have, present tense, a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <clears throat> Paul has been contrasting throughout this section from Early in chapter 4, all the way through this, he's contrasting temporary with permanent. He's contrasting the outer person with the inner person. He's contrasting the seen which, with that which cannot be seen. He points here to the tent that is our earthly home. It's a clear reference to our present earthly body, which he makes explicit in verse 6 when he says, While we are at home, in the body, the tent, the body, which is our earthly home. And remember, Paul was a tent maker by trade. Our earthly home, the tent, is the body. He is looking to the destruction, literally the taking down of that tent. You go camping, you set up a tent, it's temporary, you know that. You're not planning to spend the next 50 years and retire there. You might spend the weekend. When you're done, have you gone to a campground and found tents left there? Like, they left, but they just left their tent standing? That's not very often. Usually you take it down, you pack it up, you put it away. That's what he's saying. He's, taking, he's saying our physical body, it's a tent, it's temporary, it's not our eternal home. He's looking at death, he's looking at suffering and persecution, he's saying, yeah, pretty soon this tent, it's going to get packed up and put away. I remember the first time that I really faced the death of a loved one. I was uh, nine years old. Uh, my grandfather passed away. Uh, and we went to the funeral. And I remember as a nine-year-old, you know, your cousins are there that you don't see very often because we're out of state. And you want to just play, but there's something very sober about the, the setting. You know something's here. And I understood what was going on. And I wondered, as we're, we're in the, the chapel, and it was actually a, uh, a gymnasium because uh, my grandfather was an a, a evangelist in Iowa that did a lot of tent preaching, and many people came to Christ through his, his preaching. So it was a packed gymnasium. But I remember uh, before that, when they had the viewing uh, with my family, walking up to the front where the casket was open and wondering, well, what am I, I going to... Feel? What am I supposed to feel? What is, what's this going to be like? How am I going to respond? And, and I remember coming up and looking in the casket with my parents and seeing my grandfather there. He was uh, in his 90s when he passed away. And the thing that struck me at that point when I looked at him, and then nine years later when my grandmother, who had just turned 100, same scenario, I'm looking at her body. This is the thing that struck me. That's not Grandpa. No, they didn't mix up the body. The morticians did a fine job of making them look like themselves. But as I looked in the casket, it was clear, that's not Grandpa. That's not Grandma. They're not home. Yes, that's where they used to live. That was their, in this language, tent. But they've left. They're not there anymore. Paul 
Paul is looking at the destruction or the taking down of the earthly tent, the human body. He's been talking about affliction, about persecution, about death, right in the immediate context. And now he looks at what we know will happen to the believer, to the follower of Jesus, when this tent is taken down. Now some interpreters assume that the present tense we have must mean that immediately after death, the Christian receives his resurrection body. Because it says, we have a building from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So their assumption is, well, that must mean that somehow we get our resurrection body immediately at death, or there's many creative explanations to try to figure uh, this out. This contradicts what is t- clearly taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that it is at the return of Christ that all believers will receive their resurrection bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 21 says, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Resurrection for the believer happens when Christ returns. Uh, down in verse 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Verse 51. We shall not all sleep. Speaking of death. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we who remain who are alive shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable this mortal body must put on immortality the resurrection of the dead will happen at the last trumpet at the coming of our Lord Jesus (laughs) This is what he also teaches plainly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. As he's teaching a church about those who have fallen asleep, a a metaphor for death. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So where are those who have fallen asleep? With him. He will bring with him. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They're with the Lord, they're coming with the Lord, their dead bodies will be resurrected at the coming of the Lord. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Paul clearly is teaching that the coming, at the coming of the Lord, at the last trumpet, is when the dead in Christ will be resurrected. And then the believers who are alive at His coming will be transformed and receive glorified resurrection bodies. So what does he mean here when he says that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens? I'm not going to go into all the speculation on what this might mean. I'll give you uh, what I think is fairly plain from the scriptures. First of all, this is part of an if statement that is looking into the future. The present tense is part of a theoretical if this happens then. So it's not present right now. It's already there. It's if this tent is destroyed We have. 
We have an eternal home, a building prepared for us by God. And as we see elsewhere in the scriptures, verb tenses can indicate confident hope. Romans 8 verse 30 is one example of this. Paul describes the believer as glorified. Past tense. Not saying that it's already happened, but because God has begun a work in us, and because God is always faithful to His promises to bring that work to completion, and because He is faithful, it's as good as done. So he can put it in the past tense, saying, hey, he who me justified, he also glorified. It happens to every person that is justified. Without fail, we will be glorified. It's as good as done because it's God's word. The believer in Jesus facing death can be confident that we have a building from God, a household not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, because He promised it. And it is as good as a present possession. God's Word. We can bank on it. In verses 2 to 4, He voices a longing. He voices a groaning. This word longing indicates a strong desire as an infant craves milk. 1 Peter chapter 2. Usually in the New Testament, this is used in relational terms. It's the word that Paul uses when he says, I long to see you. As he's writing a letter, he says, I long to see you, to be with you. I miss you. I care deeply about you. I'm eager to be with you again. It says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He's, he's speaking here of an intense longing to put on a heavenly dwelling. And he's speaking of a groaning, a deep sigh under the present weight and pressure. In in this, this tent, the tent that is being destroyed, tent that is being taken down, under the present pressure, a sigh escapes. We're being made new day by day as we look to the unseen, and yet we have a deep longing for more. We've looked before at the parallels between Romans chapter 8 and our passage in 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. Uh, these parallels become even more clear and even more helpful here uh, in 2 Corinthians 5. In the context of suffering, which is in both passages, and future glory, which is in both passages, in the context of that which is seen and that which is not seen in both passages, he also points to this groaning in both passages. Let's look for a minute at Romans chapter 8. It sheds light on our passage in 2 Corinthians 5 and, and authenticates that we're on the right track in our understanding. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. And obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. 
We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For this hope, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The groaning, the groaning of the believer, the believer who has already received the Spirit as a guarantee, as a down payment, is longing, is groaning. For freedom from corruption. Freedom of glory. This longing is the longing for adoption. The, the culmination of our adoption. The redemption of our bodies. We long to be clothed with the glory of resurrection life. Now here he introduces a concept of being exposed. Being found naked. Being unclothed. He's expanding on his conception of the mortal body as a tent that is being taken down. If the mortal body is a tent, and it's being done away with, and if our hope is for resurrection bodies, those imperishable, glorious spiritual bodies, a dwelling from God not made with hands, then this hope must wait for the coming of the Lord. For the resurrection on that last day. So the question is, what happens in between time? What happens if I die before Jesus comes back? That's what he's talking about in this passage. He's concerned. What does this look like for me if I, I'm facing death? It's likely that I'm not going to be alive when Jesus comes back. It seems, from what he says, we will be in some sense a naked seed, a naked soul, not clothed in a body. Our tent is taken down, our dwelling, although we have it on God's word, we don't have it yet. We see this concept in a passage in Revelation chapter 6, where the souls of those slain for the word of God and for their witness cry out, from under the altar, O oh, Sovereign Lord, how long? And it says they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Now I'm not sure how it works to have a soul put on a robe, but that's the language we have in Revelation. Paul here is in contrast to Greek and Gnostic philosophies of his day, which viewed release from this flawed and, and failed prison of a body is true freedom. The body is holding us back. We need to be free of it. And the ideal is the naked soul that is now freed from the constraints of the body. That's a desirable condition for the Gnostics. The body is evil. Matter is evil. That's not the biblical conception. And Paul con uh, contradicts that here. Uh, the the, the uh, philosophers, Platonic philosophers, escape from the body as the ideal. Paul did not view this as desirable. You see, we were made, we were created to be embodied. He longed not to be unclothed, but to be overclothed. That word in verse 4, further clothed, it's a compound word, indicating putting something on over something else. Paul's desire is that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, that his perishable body would put on the imperishable, that his earthly body would be swallowed up in life at the coming of Christ. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us his spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, 
We make it our aim to please Him. God has made us for this. He has guaranteed that we will possess it. We will be clothed with a spiritual body. It's in this context that He gives us the second thing He knows. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 9, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. You see, this life is a life of looking at what we can't see. As Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1, 8, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We walk by faith, not sight. While we are at home in the body, we are away from the presence, the physical presence of the Lord. He is seated at the right hand of His Father in glory. We walk by faith, not by sight, but, but one day, one day, we will see Him. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as he is. The glory so. Although Paul does not desire to be unclothed, although he would rather be alive at the coming of the Lord and be overclothed, he says this here, he would rather be unclothed and in the presence of the Lord he would rather be away from the body if that means to be at home with the Lord. It's the same thing he says in Philippians chapter 1. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ to die gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. Far better, but... To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. To depart is to be with Christ. Cults, other groups teach this concept of a soul sleep. You die and you fall asleep and you don't wake up until the resurrection. You're unconscious. Paul doesn't see it that way. What he knows is that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He has a desire to depart. In this contrast of what does the intermediate state look like, his desire is to be with Christ, not to go to sleep. Then there would be no incentive for him to long for that over staying alive. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. To be at home with the Lord, far better. To live as Christ, 
To live in the flesh, it is fruitful labor, labor for others, cross-shaped life and ministry. It means suffering for the good of people. And that is fruitful, that is good. And Paul accepts that and enjoys that. But to die, he says, to die is gain. To be with Christ is what we long for, to see Him face to face, to know Him as we are fully known, to be at home with Him. That's why we do not lose heart. That's why we can always be of good courage. Father, thank You for the truth of your word. Thank you for communicating to us so clearly to put to rest so many of our fears, to give us hope, to give us the confidence and boldness that we need to face uncertainty, to face trials, to face persecution, to face our own mortality. Help us to cling to our confidence in you, in your promises, in your word. Help us not to lose heart or to lose hope. Help us to fix our eyes on the unseen reality that is ours in Jesus Christ. And Lord, stir up in our hearts a longing, an eager expectation to be with you where you are, to see your glory. May this carry us through every obstacle we face. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing some songs.